Hi, my name is Hannah. I am the communications manager at Population Connection. Thank you guys all um, for joining. I'm so excited to be able to give this presentation um, and that you all were able to virtually sign in. Um, yeah, thanks again to Rose and the membership relations team for organizing this and for doing such a great job with the Earth Day um, challenge that is ending today on Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be giving a, a, a presentation on some of the links between population and climate change, um, paying particular attention to climate vulnerability and then also the capacity for increased access to reproductive health care, um, to offset emissions, and to increase sustainable development goals uh, worldwide. Um, I guess I need to share my screen. Let me do that really quickly. Did that work? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I think most of you are, are pretty clear on this, but um, I'm just gonna start off by saying that uh, Population Connection is a US-based nonprofit that advocates for increased US funding for family planning pr programs internationally. And in addition to a lot of the advocacy work we do, we are also really invested in education and outreach specifically surrounding some of the connections, again, between global population growth, access to comprehensive health care, and environmental sustainability. So again, we focus on the kind of links between global population, health care, and the environment. And as an environmental organization, um, we're really interested in understanding and educating the public on the different ways that humans impact the environment, especially within the context of things like climate change. And as a human rights-based organization, we're very invested in understanding some of the root causes of population growth, but specifically within the context of reproductive autonomy. So we know that when uh, women are empowered to make their own decisions about reproduction, that fertility rates naturally drop. More women end up going to school, obtaining gainful employment. Um, women, children, and families are often healthier overall and society is able to um, advance as a consequence of this very necessary sort of human right. And also, Population Connection utilizes what's called a PHE, or a Population Health and Environment Approach to Development Solutions. So this means that we strive to sort of educate about the more interconnected nature of environmental sustainability and public health. So often, whenever we look at the sort of underlying issues behind uh, you know, surrounding human-induced environmental problems like that of habitat destruction or deforestation, they can often be traced back to issues of poverty or marginalization or lack of access to public health or education or so on. So by increasing access to things like public health, to family planning education, to economic opportunity, to environmental education and so forth, we can promote sort of a community-based environmental sustainability initiative while also um, facilitating broad environmental conservation efforts and increasing the overall health of human beings. Um, so more and more, the PhD approach um, and the sort of approach that we're taking to development and understanding population really recognizes that the health of um, humanity is very much dependent on the health of the planet. Um, and so I want to take this opportunity at the beginning here to talk about, um, you know, what everybody is talking about, which is the, um, which is the, the sort of links between COVID-19 and uh, population and, and in particular habitat destruction. So as we're all very well aware, um, COVID-19 has become a huge global pandemic and is affecting all of us in, in different ways, but, but largely um, you know, to the extent that many of us had previously not even thought possible. But scientists have actually been predicting this for a very long time and contend that this is actually not the only pandemic that we are going to experience in our lifetimes. And this is due largely to the fact that, you know, humans are impacting the environment and interacting with, with animals in ways that are um, entirely unsustainable. 
So COVID-19 is the latest in what's called a zoonotic disease, which means that it was transferred to humans via animals. Other examples include Ebola, SARS, and MERS, um, among, among many others. Um, there's a whole myriad of, of examples. But as scientists are starting to investigate the underlying conditions that allow for these outbreaks, they're, not, they're looking more to humans um, as being the culprit rather than animals. It's like a lag here, I think. So it's no surprise that um, animals carry viruses. Everybody is pretty clear on that, um, and that's not a, a new statement. However, factors such as you know, massive, a massive global market for wild animals, agricultural intensification or industrialized agriculture, deforestation and urbanization are bringing humans closer and closer into contact with animals, giving way for viruses to infect us much more easily. So scientists are estimating that about 70% of emerging infectious diseases in humans have a zoonotic origin and also that there are about 1.7 million undiscovered viruses that may exist in wildlife. And as researchers continue to sort of search for, for those that will cause the next animal to human spillover, um, the world's likeliest hotspots have three things in common. One, lots of people, high population density. Two, um, diverse plants and animals, so a very biodiverse landscape. Um, and three, rapid environmental changes, including climate change. So as we continue to move throughout this presentation, it's just important to remember that how relevant both population growth and climate change are to understanding and ultimately preventing the next outbreak. So there are many similarities actually between um, the recent pandemic and that of climate change. So both COVID-19 and climate change are global in scope and will affect everyone and are affecting everyone um, with the world's most marginalized populations uh, being the most vulnerable and feeling the most severe effects. Um, both COVID-19 and climate change will require large scale government intervention and response, including help with economic transitioning and, um, and support. And both have, and importantly, both have what are called tipping points, meaning that if we wait too long, if we wait to act, if we just let it sort of happen and transpire, then that will result in a cascade of effects that are irreversible and that will continue to com com compound over time, excuse me. So everybody here is probably very familiar with this uh, graph. We're looking at flattening the curve, right? Everybody's come, it's, it's quite popular. Um, and it shows what we need to do in order to flatten the curve or, or to prevent a surge in new cases that will overwhelm the healthcare system and cause um, an us unnecessary and very high amount of deaths. So if we're able to stay below the curve, the dotted line, um, by staying at home, we can actually prevent increases in new cases and our healthcare system will be able to manage and adapt more readily. And so as we're thinking about climate change, I want to encourage you to make the associations between flattening the COVID curve and also flattening the climate curve. And so this graph is new and it has not been perfected. It's meant to be a little bit more metaphorical, but, but basically to just drive home that, um, you know, if we continue business as usual and, and emit unsustainable amounts of greenhouse gases, there will come a point where we will overwhelm um, our global capacity to respond and it will be sort of too late in terms of cascading effects. So this means that we need to be doing everything possible right now in order to stop this climate crisis before it's too late. So in terms of climate change, um, the present status of climate change is, is not very great. Uh, it's not very hopeful. Um, the planet's warmest years on record were from 2015 to 2019. Um, scientists know and have publicized for a long time that global warming beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we're at 1.1 degrees Celsius now, will cause la large scale cascading um, environmental damage. However, um, glo global anthropogenic emissions are not expected to peak even by 2030. 
And scientists are now predicting that and, and showing that climate impacts are hitting harder and faster than even than they were predicting even 10 years ago. So as the global risks for climate change are increasing, um, we need to also realize that regardless of the trajectory of future emissions trends, the warming that has already resulted from emissions produced from pre-industrial times to now will cause warming and will impact the climate for hundreds and thousands to thousands of years. So again, we need to be taking this very seriously and we need to be implementing any and all solutions to, um, to climate change. So this is just a sort of pictorial example of what I was just talking about, looking at how uh, 2019 was the warmest year on record. Um, and also this graphic was uh, developed by the IPCC to show the difference in uh, substantial mitigation measures versus you know, without any uh, substantial mitigation measures. And as you can see, the effects of uh, no mitigation measures are, are quite severe in terms of the warming of the planet. And so what we're broadly looking at are, are the sort of implications of human impacts on the environment. And many of the impacts between population and the environment are well known and are probably not a surprise to any of you. Um, but worldwide, we, we affect the planet in many different ways. We destroy wildlife habitats, causing species to go extinct. We're changing the chemistries of the oceans. We're using resources at unsustainable rates. And as we're all well aware, we're contributing to climate change. And many environmentalists have um, historically and presently been concerned about the continued um, and substantial growth of the human population, partly because we understand that population growth correlates very linearly with increased resource use, consumption patterns, and environmental degradation in many cases. And in a macro context, this has proven to be very true. So if we look historically, we can see that fossil fuel production has increased in almost lockstep with population growth. And these news reports are a little bit older. I think they're from August or September, but they're sort of meant to show that I, I feel like a new um, news report is surfacing each week, warning us of the dangers of, um, and the, of this climate crisis, ranging from things like threats to our global food supply to lack of available fresh water, um, to habitat destruction, to species extinction, the list goes on, right? And humans are undoubtedly perpetuating and even causing these global issues, right? And again, time is really running out for us to be able to address this without compounding impacts. And so as the world's population continues to grow into 2100, you can see that the, the annual growth rate has fallen quite significantly. So in fact, there are many different places on the planet where uh, fertility rates are very low um, and some places where the population is actually set to decline, which is a completely separate issue. But as you can see by looking at this map, the places with the highest fertility rates represent some of the most marginalized places on Earth. So you have most of Africa and in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Latin America, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East. And here we need to make a very important distinction because I think many have made the mistake in the past of linking rapid population growth solely and exclusively to global environmental problems like climate change. And of course, this is not the case, as that logic would somehow indicate that the poorest populations are contributing the most to environmental damage and to CO2 emissions, which cause climate change. And that's just impossible. That's not true. This is a very dangerous oversimplification that has been used before, and it's just not an accurate statement. Sorry about the lag here, everyone. Oh. So in fact, things like global CO2 emissions have much to, more to do with the onset and perpetuation of, of climate change than population alone. So the US, for example, represents 25 or 5% 5 of the global population, but consumes 25% of the Earth's resources and fossil fuels. And if we look at this information in sort of a global context, it's clear that for the most part, CO2 emissions are highest in the wealthiest countries. This is both per capita and at a, at a country level. And this makes sense, right? Because consumption patterns run in accordance with things like per capita income, 
total GDP, access to resources, governmental structure, and so forth. And for this reason, population studies as they relate to the environment remain controversial. And yes, there have been some very scary, racist, classist, and extremist histories related to the very idea that there are too many people on the planet. This is, in, this is true and important to remember, um, especially, it, and, it, and even emphasize, excuse me, especially whenever we're talking about population and environment issues. But population growth is very important. Talking about population growth and family planning and environmental conservation all in the same sentence is not inherently coercive or draconian. And of course, we are in no way advocating for any state-led or drastic measures to control the population or to control you know, certain populations, right? But the fact is, greater numbers of people on the planet do great, place a, a, a greater strain on the environment, albeit at varying degrees, right? Um, each person consumes resources and causes emissions throughout their lifetime at different levels. Um, and so there are ways to talk about population within a human rights framework. And again, the fact that population size influences climate change and influences the environment should be really important to consider, um, both in regard to the imminent threats posed by climate change, but also in consideration of the fact that um, fertility rates are very high in some of the most impoverished places. So to help clarify this, we can take a look at some of the ways that demography is set to influence the planet in upcoming years. So if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that um, instead of looking at the world in terms of there being two, a developing and a developed world, Hans Rosling, who was a statistician and famous demographer, has, has created these graphics and reconceptualized the world in terms of four levels based off of relative income and population size. And as you can see, the majority of the world's population, about 5 billion people or 80%, is currently in an emerging or middle income economy. And as you can see, um, the majority of the, the world's population growth, 32100, will exist in these um, emerging or middle income countries. And historically, innovations in healthcare and advancements in technology and economic opportunity have helped increase livelihoods and standards of living for people and societies at large, which is exactly what's projected to happen with the 5 billion people currently residing on levels two and three. Um, so this is a, a really great thing. I think everybody's advocating for this. There's a, a variety of environmental and social benefits to um, increasing livelihoods and increasing health. Um, and aside from that, everybody deserves a better standard of living. Everyone deserves the ability to consume resources and increase livelihoods and live a comfortable life. And ultimately, because of increased opportunity, that means increased overall health, which then means lower fertility rates and slower population growth over time. So all very good things. One second. I'm just really thirsty. Um, but you know, in consideration, again, of the sort of imminent threats that are posed by climate change, we need to understand what this is going to mean in terms of shifts in, in resource use and greenhouse gas emissions um, and environmental degradation in a, in a macro context. And regarding the poorest 2 billion people on the planet, people on level one who are making less than $2 a day, um, they are, are largely stuck in this level because they uh, largely have access to almost no resources at all. Um, here, infant mortality and maternal death rates are very high, while education rates, economic opportunity, and um, access to health care are very low. And this is one place where population really does come into play because it is in these regions where the population is actually growing the, the very fastest. So in the upcoming decades, um, this population of 2 billion people will increase to 3 billion and then 4 billion people. So this is definitely going to happen because of what's called population momentum. But population will only, in this region, will only uh, set to decline if these populations are able to access resources to increase their standards of living and to transcend institutionalized poverty.
And the fact that many of the world's poorest populations are growing the fastest means that more people are at risk of experiencing the effects of climate change who lack the ability and or capital necessary to readily um, respond or recover. So rapid population growth, which again is most prevalent in low income settings, presents very real challenges for sustainable development and environmental sustainability. So while 40, the 47 least developed countries are also the fastest growing, nine out of the 10 most climate vulnerable countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is expected to double in population just by 2050. Um, and many of the links between population and climate vulnerability are, are quite visible already around the world. Um, and due to geography, a lot of low income countries are already very prone to things like droughts, or flooding or natural disasters, all of which will increase significantly because of climate change. So for example, we can take a country like Bangladesh. Bangladesh is kind of a famous example of climate justice. Bangladesh is about the size of New York, but has a population of 164.7 million people in comparison to 20 million, which is also a quite <laughs> pretty hefty, hefty population. <clears throat> So that makes it the eighth most populous country in the world, and it, and it makes it so that it encompasses 2% of the entire global population. So this country is growing um, both economically and in terms of population very quickly. So the country is actually expected to exceed 200 million people by 2045, according to the UN's median variant. Um, and Bangladesh, from a sort of climate perspective, actually contributes a fraction <clears throat> of CO2 emissions in comparison to the United States. So 0.4, <clears throat> excuse me, metric tons in comparison to R17. I'm sending my throat, sorry. But the country is, is supposed to um, experience major damage from sea level rise. So it's projected that a three foot rise in sea level will submerge about 20% of the country and displace over 30 million people by the end of the century. And interestingly, from a population perspective, Bangladesh is considered a very prominent emerging economy that's expected to grow significantly in upcoming years. So therefore the country is experiencing large scale immigration and urbanization, um, all of which are, are good things ostensibly, but, but that increase the threats posed by climate change relative to things like infrastructure development, um, access to resources, and so on. Again, Bangladesh is already particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change because of its low elevation and high population density. Um, and so the country is already experiencing many of the effects of climate change, which are just going to continue to worsen in upcoming years. Another really important example is the Sahel region of Sub-Saharan Africa. So here, um, the temperature is in increasing right alongside population growth, rapid population growth. The, Sah the Sahel region has the most rapid population growth in the entire world. And so therefore, they're experiencing really intense issues um, related to development and uh, climate change adaptation and food production. So in the Sahel region of Sub-Saharan Africa, 100 to 200 million people will actually likely lack reliable food supplies in the next 30 to 40 years. The Sahel region is growing very significantly. Um, well, it will likely reach over 300 million people by 2050 and 600 million people by 2100. And here in terms of climate change, temperatures here are rising one and a half times faster <clears throat> than the global average. And future projections are showing that an increase of three to five degrees Celsius above 2013 levels is likely um, to hit before 2050. And it could, re could reach over eight degrees Celsius above the same levels by the end of the century, which is just hard to imagine. So climate change is causing, already causing frequent droughts and floods, which increasingly undermine food production in a region where 80% where of farmland is already degraded. 
And so in these contexts, population growth is, is and rapid population growth is actually quite dangerous, right? It, it hinders development by increasing hunger, increasing greenhouse gas emissions through industrialization, and contributing to habitat destruction, which has a myriad of, myriad of, of effects, excuse me. So here, investments in things like sustainable developments, which include women's empowerments and access to healthcare and family planning, will help build resilience and adaptive capacity for all populations. And this is particularly important for places like the Sahel and like Bangladesh, which are um, you know, particularly low income, but that are experiencing very rapid population growth and will experience very severe climate impacts despite contributing very little to overall global CO2 emissions. My goodness. Okay, so in recognition of all of these different and inter interconnected issues, we work to increase access to family planning. Family planning has a multitude of benefits for in social, environmental, and economic contexts, so much so that it is vitally connected to all of the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Um, and just briefly, I mean, access to sexual and reproductive health care can influence population dynamics through voluntary fertility reductions um, and lower infant and maternal mortality rates. So these are some of the examples of the benefits in societal terms of family planning. Um, but access to quality, comprehensive reproductive health care increases the health, welfare, and life expectancy of women and children, advances individuals' rights, reduces poverty, and slows population growth through voluntary measures. And together, these, these benefits really help strengthen environmental sustainability and state stability, stability as well. Sorry. And, sorry. And increasingly, from, from an environmental perspective, um, family planning is being recognized internationally as a critical human rights-based and cost-effective approach to climate change adaptation and resilience building. And of course, the ability of countries to effectively and equitably respond to climate change is, is very complex and is going to require complex and integrative solutions. Um, but it's predicated, again, on a greater understanding of the connections between interrelated development strategies. So in this way, family planning play, plays a very important role because it, it, it reduces climate change vulnerability and can act as a, an adaptation strategy, as well as contribute to um, societal development and sustainable development goals more broadly. So research has shown that uh, meeting the, glo the global unmet need for family planning has very substantial implications for slowing uh, climate change by reducing 85 gigatons of CO2 equivalent between now and 2050, excuse me, which is equi equivalent to closing permanently 22,000 coal-fired power plants. Um, family planning is also extremely cost-effective, so the emissions averted through investments in family planning are actually much cheaper in comparison to other innovations like um, solar power and carbon capture from new coal plants. And so worldwide, we work to sort of address the unmet need for family planning, recognizing its environmental and social importance. Um, and worldwide, the, most, the world's most marginalized populations are, yes, the most vulnerable to climate impacts, but also have the highest unmet need for family planning. So here's an example of this. This is a little, a little old, um, but it, sh it shows the sort of links between um, population and population growth and climate change hotspots, and then also family planning needs. And as you can see, there's a very high unmet need um, in places like the Sahel and other places that are, that are particularly vulnerable to climate change already. So in much of the Sahel, for example, the use of contraceptives is below 10%. And while this is true, there's actually um, research coming out looking at the, the unmet need, and it's very significant in these regions, indicating that if people had access to reproductive health care and family planning services, that they would use it and they, and they want it. Um, 
And there's a variety of reasons why, you know, contraceptive use is below 10% aside from access alone, but this is something that we need to kind of investigate further. In Bangladesh, um, Bangladesh has been a uh, kind of a success story with regards to family planning and innovations in reproductive health care. They've invested very heavily um, in, in family planning. They've uh, done massive PR campaigns sort of advocating for contraceptive use. And as a consequence, they've seen some really great results in terms of lowering fertility rates um, and increasing access to contraceptives. But still, um, one third of pregnancies in Bangladesh are unintended, which is you know, signaling a, a, an unmet need and, and further work to be done there. And in conclusion, um, there are 214 million women um, in developing regions alone right now who want to prevent pregnancy but are not using any modern form of contraception. And this results in about 89 million unintended pregnancies each year. And by the way, while this, while this presentation is clearly focused internationally, there's also a very high unmet need in, in higher income countries as well, such as the United States, um, where about 45% of pregnancies are unintended. So in conclusion, um, we can look at population growth as contributing to climate vulnerability around the world and hindering sustainable development initiatives worldwide. And slowing population growth through voluntary family planning and increasing access to reproductive health care um, can positively affect global efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change and increase resilience, especially for the world's most marginalized regions. Also, investments in comprehensive reproductive health care actually foster development and reduce climate impacts globally. And this is the last slide. It's a quote from Paul Hawken, who um, has done a lot of the research looking at the impact of family planning on emissions reductions. Um, and I just thought it was a good quote to end on. So we'll leave it there and then open it up for questions after everybody can read that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nana, for that amazing presentation. Um, and we have our first question here. Um, and also, guys, if you have any more questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, our first question, Hannah, is would increased funding from countries like the U.S. be able to get past the lack of political win in some of these countries? Um, Sorry, can you, could you repeat that? Would an increase in funding? From countries like the US be able to get past the lack of political will in some of the countries that you mentioned during your presentation. So would it, would increased funding help? I'm sorry, it, it keeps cutting out. Would increased funding from countries like the US be able to get past the lack of political will in some of the countries you mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the United States is actually the biggest single contributor of global aid um, and family planning aid internationally. So the potential impact is, is quite large. Um, and I think in, in the research that I've done in terms of you know, political will and sort of cultural orientation, um, if, if leaders and um, governments are able to realize the sort of effects of family planning and the benefits and, and implement these strategies as a way of slowing population growth um, and helping uh, with women's empowerment and so forth, um, that sort of transcends any sort of religious or cultural affiliation. So for example, um, in sort of a, a larger scale context, uh, places like Latin America, which have a really um, influential Catholic influence, um, are, their fertility rates are, are lower than you would expect given that affiliation. And that's, I think, because of state-led measures that are, um, in many cases, increasing access to an education about contraceptives. And that's not across the board. That's kind of a, a macro interpretation. But yes, I think that USAID is, is very uh, important, also under threat. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, could you please list um, the important components of women empowerment? 
What are the important components of women empowerment? Yes. Well, there are um, many. Um, women's empowerment is uh, very necessary. It's foundational for um, societal development. It's foundational for um, economic opportunity, for slowing population growth. Um, it's, it's a sort of human right, I think, for uh, women to be able to access the resources necessary in order to live an autonomous life, um, including reproductive freedom, but also you know, the right to education, the right to access resources and things like that. Um, it's incredibly influential in, in, in ways that we're kind of familiar with in terms of you know, social development and um, you know, increasing livelihoods and welfare and well-being and things like that, but also again, within the context of, you know, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, so I would say it's, it's across the board very important. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Do you fear that the global emphasis on addressing the coronavirus will divert attention from the very real concerns you are speaking of? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's, it, it's kind of hard to tell. There's been um, a lot of literature that has come out that has kind of drawn on these similarities between the impacts of COVID and the potential impacts of climate change, um, recognizing that while COVID-19, the impacts are immediate, climate change will have um, just as impactful, if not greater, um, influences on the global population and the way that we you know, live. Um, I forgot where I was going with that, but essentially, yes, there are many different similarities and, um, you know, that we've seen some positive impacts like increased air quality and, um, you know, we're, we've basically shut down a lot of the global economy, which has really contributed to lower emission standards and things like that. Um, but it's going to depend on, on where we go from here and whether or not we take this opportunity to um, re to start investing in renewable energies, to start shifting towards um, a global economy that's um, a little bit more, you know, progressive and environmentally conscious, or if we just sort of revert back and, and continue down the same path. Um, I, I hope that this pandemic is an opportunity to, again, realize that the health of um, humanity is very much predicated on the health of the environment. Um, and to sort of take a different approach to um, the economy moving forward, but we'll have, just have to see. All right, next question says, um, do you fear that the global emphasis on addressing the coronavirus will divert attention from the very real, oh, I think I just asked you that question, no, my apologies. <laughs> I did, so sorry, I was scrolling back up. Okay, here we go. Um, will the impacts of the coronavirus, um, is it likely that people now will want to reduce the number of children they have because of concerns about the future? Um, I was just reading an article some, substantiating that claim. Um, so it's quite possible that people are looking at the potential impacts of climate change and something like pandemics and recognizing that these are going to increase in frequency unless we change our global habits. Um, to you know, use that as a reason to stop having children or to stop having as many children. Um, I I don't know. I think it will depend on where our economy ends up being and whether or not people in the United States anyway can kind of access uh, reproductive health care um, and you know practice reproductive autonomy because that seems to be under threat as well right now. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, um, how can we convince our representatives that population should be entered in climate change policy? That's a really good question. And I think it sort of goes back to recognizing the, the interconnected nature of, of population growth. Um, so population growth has very linear sort of correlations with you know, CO2 emissions and environmental degradation, but also um, it's very much linked to poverty and marginalization, right? So high fertility rates, uh, are, are most prevalent in places with um, very low economic status and a high un unmet need for contraceptives. So if we're looking at climate change as a, as a global problem, which it is, which is and something that will affect everyone, then we really need to be working in solidarity um, to sort of tackle these global solutions. And one way to do that is to recognize family planning as an 
integrate a solution that looks at and tackles both environmental and social concerns. Um, uh, should the UNFPA launch an international campaign, which is totally voluntary, to encourage nations around the world to essentially reduce their, their family sizes? Um, I would say no on that. It's a good thought, but um, we want to make sure that we're kind of understanding the, the broader implications here of, of population growth. And population growth um, in a rapid context exists, again, because of um, you know, lack of access, access to resources and oppression of women and, um, you know, no access to family planning and poverty, right? So if we address those issues and if women are empowered to make their own decisions about reproduction, to go to school, to find, you know, and, and sustain a gainful employment, then fertility rates will naturally drop. Um, I think that people just need access to contraceptives and education surrounding the importance of family planning um, in order to, to see fertility rates drop. That's what we've seen around the world, right? In, in many uh, sort of industrialized nations, fertility rates are quite low because the status of women, so to speak, is, is higher um, than it is in places with rapid population growth and high um, levels of oppression of women. Okay, and then I have one last question here, unless anyone else um, has any, is how can we help others understand that most of the Earth's societal economical issues are due to human um, population and other uses such as competition of resources, land, space, housing, etc. So how can how can we help people understand that many global issues are the result of human impacts on the environment? Essentially. Um, well, that's a good question. And I think it, it kind of goes back to understanding how everything is interconnected, how we influence the environment, the environment that influences us and the ability of us for the ability that um, of us to sort of adapt to and respond to a changing climate is, is very much, you know, up to us. It's up to us to prevent the next pandemic. It's up to us to meet the Paris Agreement standards and to um, sort of flatten the climate curve and to prevent sort of cascading compounding effects. Um, we have the ability to do that. We just have to really recognize how inter interconnected everything is um, and, and recognize that social development and, and social justice are, are very one in the same with things like environmental sustainability and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Awesome. And then we do have another question here. Um, I guess this is more of a question asking for clarification on some things. Um, but one of our guests wanted to said, um, I don't think people understand the challenges to having birth and being a mother in other parts of the world. What are the cultural challenges in medical care in the developing countries like? So kind of just talking about the experiences and some of the challenges that um, women are facing around the world, giving, you know, when it comes to um, giving birth, um, being a mother, can you talk a little bit more about some of those economical challenges, some of the lack of resources that they have in regards to their medical care? Yeah, well, I think it's important to, uh, you know, be geographically specific. I mean, there are plenty of places in the world um, that are considered developing or low income and but that are, are quite different from one another. Um, and I think it would depend on you know, each country and, and perhaps even each region or, or locale. Um, but generally speaking, again, rapid population growth is uh, very linearly correlated with poverty. So you know, poverty goes hand in hand with lack of access to resources, with the oppression of women. And so um, you know, I think a lot of people are, and, and women are, are marrying at very young ages as a consequence of having no other opportunity or because they are oppressed, um, having children at very young ages, which is quite dangerous, um, having little access to uh, hospitals or other medical care, which would ensure a safe delivery. Um, so in, in really impoverished places, there's, you know, really high rates of growth, but also really high rates of infant mortality and um, maternal deaths as well. Um, so it's, it's really dangerous. <laughs> it's a really dangerous situation. But the, the important thing to remember is that people are oftentimes having children against 
their will because they have no other option. And I believe this will be our final question, just so we don't keep everyone on here too long. Um, and Hannah, if you can speak to this, um, one of our comments and questions is, um, I thought the Trump administration had banned family planning assistance to other countries, um, yet it was said that the U.S. was the largest funder. Are private organizations funding these efforts? And if you are aware of, off the top of your head, who are the biggest donors? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the U.S. is the biggest uh, contributor, like as a country, to global aid. Um, but you're right in that the Trump administration has reinstituted what's called the global gag rule, which heavily limits uh, the way that global aid is distributed, um, and in particular, family planning funds. Um, so it's caused, it's had some pretty devastating effects in terms of funding and in terms of access to care. Um, and there are many different uh, organizations, private organizations that are contributing to family planning funding in addition to other countries as well. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is very um, prominent in this space. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you everyone for submitting these questions. I hope we were able to clarify any questions or concerns that you may have during this presentation. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this and our talk from John last week. Um, so if you'd like to listen to these again or you'd like some more resources, just know that those will be available to you. Um, once again, thank you, Hannah, and thank you everyone for tuning in. If there is uh, some additional questions that you do have um, in regards to either this presentation or another one, feel free to email us at engage at popconnect.org. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any feedback for us as well, we'd love to hear it. Um, stay tuned. We do plan on having some more Zoom calls um, for you guys. It seems like these are very popular and um, that we're all learning a lot from these presentations. So we hope that we can continue to bring these to you during this time. Um, so once again, thank you. And I hope you guys have a great day.